Welcome, everybody, and many thanks for joining us today. It's, uh, it's very much appreciated. Um, we still have people joining, so probably this group will be changing a little bit. Uh, we might repeat some of the technical information in a moment, but before um, we start, it will be Olena um, starting uh, the meeting. I just wanted to say hello and provide some technical information. Um, the event is organized, first of all, by the Yaroslav Mulch University in Kharkiv, which is represented today here by Olena Uvarva, with which we work for a long time, and today so um, we are happy to support the organization of this event um, just at this very short notice. So apologies for any um, perhaps um, small um, issues, small technical issues, but it seems that they've been overcome as you could join. Um, first things first, it's important to state that um, because we are, we've decided to record this meeting, your participation in the meeting today will basically mean that you have agreed um, for you to be recorded. However, uh, about, I mean, we'll, we will be cutting off the beginning. So if you will feel more secure and would prefer to change um, the way you are assigned, you are free to do so. It was important for us simply to know who is joining. Um, but right now you are free to change uh, the description and feel free also to switch off the video. Um, there will be translation provided from English to Ukrainian. It is already actually going on. Um, it's just that Zoom doesn't have the settings for Ukrainian. Uh, at least we haven't found them. So Ukrainian is um, basically under Polish. But we've tried to notify you in the emails, but basically if you choose Polish, that means Ukrainian. And uh, we are really apologizing for this. We just didn't, um, weren't able to change that. Um, the meeting I've said will be uh, recorded. And yes, we might experience some technical issues, so we hope that you'll uh, forgive us. Um, there were also some last minute changes to the agenda, not the huge ones, but apologies for that as well. Um, that's what happens when you organize something at a very short notice. And now let me stop and hand over to Elena. Uh, who will start today's meeting and um, will introduce us to the objectives and basically the topics of today's discussion. Many thanks. Дуже дуже дякую, Дата. Я буду говорити українською. Я про всяк випадок повторю, що ви можете чути переклад українською, interpretation або переклад кнопка і там обрати польський канал і будете чути український переклад. Перш за все, я хочу дуже подякувати всім, хто сьогодні доєднався. Це також важлива підтримка для нас сьогодні. І надзвичайно вдячна, звичайно, пані Біаті Фарачек і всьому Польському інституту справ людини і бізнесу, які, які підтримали ідею провести цей захід і доклали дуже багато зусиль для того, щоб його провести. І також вдячні Міжнародному Вишеградському фонду, з яким ми планували провести зовсім інший захід, також про відповідальну бізнес-поведінку, але в зовсім в іншому контексті, але вони проявили гнучкість і погодилися на те, щоб підтримати зміну тематики, незважаючи на те, що ми ще не знаємо, як далі ми будемо реалізовувати всі заплановані наші дії. А, і я, власне, почну дуже коротко, тому що ви бачили, в нас багато заплановано на сьогодні, а, тому а, я відразу почну коротко, розкажу те, що, і, власне, я хотіла б сьогодні обсудити, але це а, наша сьогоднішня мета, власне, максимально визначити, зробити огляд тих викликів для відповідальної бізнес-поведінки, які ми на сьогодні маємо в Україні і поза Україною. І ці контексти, я думаю, дуже відрізняються, що можуть робити і мають робити компанії, які працюють безпосередньо в Україні, і що можуть і мають робити компанії, які працюють поза Україною. Для того, щоб розуміти контекст, в якому ми сьогодні знаходимося, це мапа України, і з неї видно, що абсолютно вся територія України на сьогодні 
піддається атаці з боку Росії і, власне, жодного місця в Україні на сьогодні немає, яке б не було задіяно у війну. І, відповідно, бізнеси, які працюють в Україні, вони абсолютно всі відчувають вплив військових дій, і люди, які знаходяться в Україні, відчувають цей вплив, і це важливо для розуміння цього контексту. І крім того, ми також маємо розуміти, що на сьогодні територія України – вона також є різниця в тому, що відбувається. Є територія України, яка перебуває у воєнному стані, але активних військових дій, окрім окремих ракетних ударів, немає. І тут бізнеси працюють, звичайно, в зміненому режимі, але ну, більш-менш в спокійному. Є територія України, де ведуться активні військові дії, ну, наприклад, Харків, який сьогодні вночі знову був дуже активно обстріляний. І є територія України, яка, на жаль, є тимчасово окупованою російськими військами. Наприклад, я сьогодні списувалася з колегами з Бердянську, вони перебувають під контролем російських військ, на жаль, і це також інші зовсім контексти. Мелітополь, де багато знайомих так само. Тому на сьогодні це три різні контексти, в яких працюють компанії в Україні, і виклики перед цими компаніями також стоять різні. І для мене, як для людини, яка знаходиться в Україні, і я готова говорити про контекст всередині України, я не буду говорити про контекст поза Україною, це от Біата і наші інші колеги скажуть. Для мене в першу чергу йдеться про роль компаній, які задіяні до так званої критичної інфраструктури. Це ті компанії, які постачають тепло, це ті компанії, які постачають продукти харчування, ліки, які воду постачають, які надають медичні послуги, які задіяні до послуг, транспортних послуг, громадського транспорту, які постачають електроенергію, надають телекомунікаційні послуги, надають фінансові та банківські послуги. Ну, як свідок того, що відбувається, я можу сказати, що, наприклад, в Харкові, коли ще не було масових бомбардувань, лише перший день війни був, я хочу сказати, що бізнес повівся дуже по-різному. Були бізнеси, які відразу зачинилися, навіть аптеки. Були ті, які продовжують функціонувати навіть сьогодні під обстрілами. І насправді питання от, о, людей, які залишаються на тих територіях, які піддаються обстрілам, ці люди дуже залежні від поведінки бізнесів. І як тут збалансувати бізнесам безпеку своїх працівників? І те, що від цих критичних бізнесів залежить життя людей, які залишаються на цих територіях, це, звичайно, дуже великий виклик як цей баланс досягти. Тому що, наприклад, в Харкові в перші ж дні було таке, що деякі бізнеси, ну, люди, які опинилися без кешу, да, без е, е, ну, налічних да, грошей, вони нічого не могли собі купити, тому що бізнеси повністю відмовилися від приймання оплати картками. І це також ну, був такий виклик, ну, я вже не кажу, що, як я сказала, що не можна купити ліки і так далі. А, тому, а, на мій погляд, це також ну, важливе питання а, до обговорення, що може робити держава, щоб підтримати ці бізнеси, які працюють, а, як бізнесам а, вибудувати свою поведінку в таких умовах. 
Знов таки, ми обговорювали сьогодні зранку з колегами, що робити тим бізнесам, які опинилися на тимчасово окупованій території. Тому що відмовитися від надання цих критичних послуг, це означає створити гуманітарну катастрофу на цій території. Залишитися і продовжувати функціонувати, це дуже часто означає співпрацювати з окупаційним режимом. І це також виклик. І тут також ще відрізняється поведінка на сьогодні між приватними компаніями, комунальними підприємствами і державними підприємствами. Все ж таки комунальні і державні підприємства, транслюючи позицію держави, функціонують більш стабільно сьогодні ну, на оцих найбільш ризикованих територіях. Я не кажу, що це загальне правило, Є відповідальні бізнеси, але на сьогодні от така картина. І, звичайно, ще одне питання з погляду внутрішньої ситуації – це бізнес як роботодавець. Я дуже рада, що сьогодні у нас про це буде говорити Європейська бізнес-асоціація, тому що якраз вони можуть навести гарні практики, практики відповідального бізнесу, того бізнесу, який допомагав в евакуації своїх працівників, забезпечував безпеку, надавав компенсацію чи іншу допомогу, продовжує платити зарплату. Але я також хочу наголосити, що є і багато зворотних прикладів, тому що все ж таки Європейська бізнес-асоціація об'єднує найбільші відповідальні компанії в Україні. На жаль, я особисто знаю зовсім інші. Приклади також, коли евакуація, безпека, отримання, ну, стає просто питанням, особистим питанням для людей і так далі. Тому сьогодні, от точки зору внутрішнього, внутрішнього погляду з України, нам би, звичайно, дуже хотілося б визначити оці гарні практики, поділитися ними визначити, які основні ризики для прав людини, які може, на які може реагувати бізнес, або на які навіть повинен реагувати бізнес. Визначити оці виклики щодо побудови співпраці між бізнесом, громадянським суспільством, міжнародними організаціями та іншими. Визначити, що держава може робити. Наприклад, Україна от запровадила державне регулювання цін на критичні продукти. А визначити, які бар'єри у доступі, знов таки, до засобів захисту, це складно на сьогодні забезпечувати, але це все рівно має це питання стояти. Тому, з мого боку, я на цьому зупинюся, я дуже очікую на плідну дискусію, ще раз дуже дякую всім, хто доєднався, і зараз я передаю слово пані Діаті Парачу. Дякую, Олена. І просто кажу, що... What I'll follow is kind of the perspective more from the outside, because we've just heard what are some of the most critical issues uh, within Ukraine. Uh, when it comes to business operations, uh, or when it comes to operations of business, which is a kind of outside of Ukraine, or at least um, its headquarters are outside of Ukraine, the perspective slightly differs. What overlaps is certainly uh, the issue of care for the employees, be it um, outside of Ukraine or in Ukraine, but then there is also much stronger focus on the assistance and what business can do to support um, refugees and help to alleviate some of the pressure um, that is currently faced on, um, on the state, although I'll kind of uh, I'll address the state issue at the, at the end. So what we hear most, um, and that was also very clear in our discussions uh, with Olena, is that um, kind of our perspective, the discussions, for example, within Poland, um, but also, I guess, in, in other countries, and we'll hear later from Jurene and uh, colleagues or from, from Czech and Slovakia, um, a lot of efforts focus on, first of all, assistance to refugees, be it um, some donations, providing in-kind support, uh, providing places in accommodation, uh, even though hospitality services were very strongly hit during the COVID and a number of places um, closed down or suffered financially, uh, a number of those um, institutions open up. And like, for example, ARCA Group uh, offered around 5,000 places for the people to stay. 
Um, but then there is kind of a major part is about um, assistance to Ukrainian workers in Poland um, or in other countries. Uh, because people do understand that um, basically workers will need to take some time off to be able to take care of their families. So we see companies reacting by providing a few additional days of paid leave for people to be able to just focus on um, helping their closest. Um, there are um, obviously initiatives around financial assistance, and we'll also hear later because we hear both about non-refundable um, contributions so, or uh, support given to the, the workers or some salaries paid in advance for several months so that the funds that are needed now um, can be deployed now. Uh, obviously, there are a number of um, contributions to different humanitarian uh, causes and different organizations that are organizing support and humanitarian efforts. And then there is a very important part about competence, voluntary support, and we'll hear later today also from Tech from Ukraine, from other uh, companies from BNP Paribas, from NG, uh, who are also engaging by providing the time of their employees to help organize a number of things. So we'll hear in more detail a little bit later, but we kind of see a whole variety of ways in which companies can engage. And then there is also a very important element of assistance being provided by companies from outside of UK uh, of um, Ukraine uh, to the Ukrainian workers, namely either assistance, either direct workers or just workers of the partners. And um, we see assistance with relocation being in, in the format of providing some financial, again, some financial assistance, non-refundable funds that people can use to organize safe travel or passage outside. Uh, there are, we hear about some organized convoys. There are some issues around that as well. Um, there are some payments of salaries, obviously, which is very important currently to be sustained. So people do have something to live on, but also there is, I would say, this element of looking ahead uh, because we none of us knows whether some critical, also banking infrastructure is not affected. So. There are some companies that are looking currently into, for example, cryptocurrency as an alternative to the official kind of to the normal banking flows in case banking system is affected. Obviously, all those type of activities are raising additional issues and different issues around um, human rights due diligence and making sure that by trying to do good at the right moment, um, some collateral damage is not um, caused. Uh, obviously, there is one very visible element as well when it comes to the activities of companies. It's a question of divestment from Russia. So a number of companies are either suspending or withdrawing or it's very, um, in a way, it's, you, you, you yourself can observe that there are a number of companies that are very vocal that are sharing information about what they do, uh, about their ac activities and operations in Russia, but also there are some companies that are basically totally blanked out. And uh, again, I don't want to assess, I don't want to kind of judge. Uh, I can understand that if somebody has um, operations with several thousand people in Russia, and they also don't want to put those people at risk. So um, I think we, we should be very far away from black and white in some, uh, on some issues, but uh, what we will hear today is about what activities are being undertaken by business, by NGOs, how the collaborations between NGOs and business for, look like, what sort of challenges are being faced, because in some countries, including Poland, there is a legislation around, for example, paying taxes on donations and humanitarian support is, I think, currently still being a kind of in process. So, what we see is that uh, a number of states that just don't have the necessary, and Poland is among them, still doesn't have the necessary uh, legislative framework to deal with the situations like that. And I uh, say it very bitterly because in Poland since 2015, so basically the approach of the government was to basically starve financially all the organizations that are de dealing with migrant issues because that was not in line with the party um, position. So. Um, what we are seeing, at least in Poland, and it would be very interesting to hear from colleagues from other countries, um, what we are seeing in Poland is that 
basically the heat, uh, the main heat is being taken and kind of supported, um, let's say, or the reaction is being organized actually mainly by uh, business and NGOs working together or trying to coordinate efforts, uh, as well as local authorities and local cities, particularly kind of closer to the border, also now also um, and a number of cities are engaged and are preparing uh, places for refugees and provide support and so on. Um, and the government is still kind of working on the special legislation, which is meant to simplify issues around uh, registration, registration of business in Poland. There are some talks about waiving tax, the taxes of different sorts for Ukrainians who are coming to Poland. So, but this is still in the making. So I think it's also important to remember that states actually should proactively also work on their legislation for such situations so that it's not done kind of overnight in the heat of the action. Um, and I'll stop here because I don't want to take time from our colleagues. Unfortunately, we had the issue with, um, with a video connection um, with Anita. So I'll just hand over to Elena to go ahead with the first panel, which will be focusing on uh, Ukrainian perspectives. And uh, please feel free to put questions into the chat. Um, we've tried to provide we want, what we want to, to do is to provide you with a number of perspectives from different companies, organizations, so that you can make your kind of, so that you can have a broader picture. Um, and we'll kind of move to the discussions at the end, but having your questions as they come along uh, in the chat will be very, very helpful. So many thanks. And Elena, over to you. Дуже дякую, Беата, і я хочу відразу запросити до слова пані Олену Степаненко, яка є представницею уповноваженого Верховної Ради України з прав людини з соціальних та економічних питань, і Офіс уповноваженого, звичайно, працює, і, будь ласка, пані Олена, які основні такі критичні питання пов'язані з ролью компанії в Україні зараз? Всім доброго дня, вітаю, всім бажаю доброго здоров'я у цей складний час. Рада всіх вас бачити і дійсно, Олено, я дуже сподіваюся, що на Харківському форумі ми зустрінемося очно і це буде вже в мирній Україні. Дякую всім за підтримку України, українців. Пані Біата, дякую Польщі і особисто уповноваженому справ людини Польщі, які постійно на зв'язку з Денісовою Людмилою Леонтівною, з нашим уповноваженим справ людини України, який надає не тільки гуманітарну допомогу, а і підтримку роботі нашого офісу. Я хочу, по-перше, сказати, що дійсно офіс працює, Працює повноважений справ людини Людмила Леонтівна постійно в офісі, постійно працює частина там нашої команди. Інші, хто може працювати дистанційно, працює дистанційно. Дуже велика кількість наших працівників задіяна в роботі в регіонах. Вони працюють з тимчасово переміщеними особами, надають їм консультації, надають їм поради, де і як розселитися і співпрацюють з місцевою владою. Хочу сказати, що за дорученням уповноваженого зараз у нас організована цілодобова горяча лінія, куди наші громадяни і громадяни інших країн, які зараз знаходяться на території України, можуть звернутися за допомогою, за порадою, в тому числі повідомити про порушення прав людини, які відбуваються у цей час. Ми зараз працюємо дуже оперативно, тобто нема зараз часу робити запити до органів місцевої влади або державної влади, або до роботодавців про те, щоб з'ясувати ситуацію. Тобто ми зараз постійно працюємо за допомогою телефонного зв'язку, месенджерів, оперативно отримую інформацію, якщо щось відбувається, зв'язуємося з координаційними штабами, з гуманітарними штабами, які організовані зараз в Україні і Міністерством соціальної політики, і Офісом президента, і Кабінетом міністрів України координуємо зв'язок не тільки щодо вирішення питань, як тимчасово переміщеним особам в регіонах, де немає активних бойових дій, отримати пенсійні виплати, 
отримати соціальні допомоги, виплати на дитину, декретні, навіть звертається з питань, як зараз зареєструвати шлюб громадянам України, як виїхати іноземним громадянам, через які пункти пропуску. Це ну, дуже такі, знаєте, нагальні зараз питання, з якими ми працюємо з нашими громадянами. В тому числі, Пані уповноважена постійно на зв'язку з міжнародними організаціями. Я хочу сказати, що за останні два тижні вона вже спілкувалася із Верховним комісаром ООН Мішель Бачелет, із комісаром з прав людини Ради Європи Дуні Мятович, із президентом Ганрі Карлосом Ернеста Камара. І з головою НРІ, це Європейська, бізнес, Європейська асоціація уповноважених справ людини Каролін Фенел. Ми зверталися і до координатора ООН з кризових питань щодо ситуації організації гуманітарних коридорів. Тобто постійно уповноважена на зв'язку з усіма органами влади і з нашими громадянами. Щодо бізнесу, ви знаєте, дуже багато приходить звернень громадян на нашу гарячу лінію щодо ситуації, як Олена сказала, наприклад, у Харкові, коли не працюють відділення пошти. І ті люди, які не можуть, які не отримували виплати пенсійні або соціальні на картки банківські, а через Укрпошту, от в таких, на жаль, зонах бойових дій активних не можуть отримати зараз пенсію через те, що не працює відділення Укрпошти. Але держава дуже оперативно реагує, і я знаю, що зараз ці люди переводяться на відділення Ощадбанку, або визначаються оперативно інші дійсно банки, які можуть здійснити ці виплати. Крім того, ви знаєте дійсно, що через незалежні від роботодавців причини бізнес міг припинити свою діяльність, особливо в регіонах, там, де ведуться активні бойові дії. Тому уряд дуже оперативно вирішив це питання і працівнику таких роботодавців буде виплачено по 6,5 тисяч гривень, якщо там закрилися роботи підприємств. Крім того, для бізнесу зроблено державою послаблення, це не надання звітів фізичними особами підприємців до податкової, до пенсійного фонду через те, що дійсно це не можна об'єктивно зробити. На жаль, які ми фіксували, ну ще з доброго, от, особисто просто в Києві бізнес, який надає послуги очищення питної води, ну от всі ці дні ці маленькі такі ларьочки, вони були відчинені і там безкоштовно киянам надавали питну воду. І це, це приватний бізнес, це не державні установи, це маленький приватний бізнес, але він надавав безкоштовно цю воду киянам. Крім того, дійсно, у перші дні, ну це було таке розгублення, я думаю, бізнесу, і саме і працівники не знали, як їм діяти, але все ж таки зараз бізнес, мені здається, вже змобілізувався. І крім того, що дійсно надають транспорт для вивезення з передмістя Києва, Буча, Ірпень, Гостоміль, які просто зрівняні з землею ці житлові масиви, які були, ну просто, знаєте, такі оазіси, виїжджали кияни просто жити, бо там дуже чисте повітря, побудовані дитячі садочки, школи, то там просто... Просто зараз зруйновано все. І от у нас працівник навіть три дні, мій підлеглий, який працював в моєму департаменті моніторингу соціальних прав, не міг вийти на зв'язок, бо він був в підвалі з дитиною, з дружиною, там було 300 таких осіб. І от тільки вчора вночі він виїхав, змогли наші евакуувати цих людей, вони зараз їдуть на Вінницю, і таких, ну, і от транспорт дав, автобуси дали і комунальні підприємства, і дав бізнес для того, щоб вивезти цих людей. І сказати, щоб з тих звернень, які зараз надходять до уповноваженого, то було декілька звернень, що припинили діяльність будівельні компанії і не виплатили заробітну плату працівникам. 
Тобто припинили будівництво і люди залишилися без заробітної плати. Але ми ці факти всі фіксуємо, назви компаній, працівники, які до нас зверталися. Я думаю, ну, і ми повернемося до розгляду цих звернень, бо зараз не можна встановити, де той власник того будівництва і скільки там було працівників. Пані Олена, дуже-дуже вам дякуємо, дуже дякуємо. Ми, да. Ми... Тому, да, тому я на завершення дякую всім, хто долучилися дійсно. І ще пані Беата, ви правильно підкреслили, що є декілька компаній, які не припиняють роботу в Російській Федерації. До речі, можна з цим переліком компаній ознайомитися на сайті, їх зібрали МЗС, і це вже на розсуд людей, як чи купувати цю продукцію, чи ні. Дякую вам всім за підтримку і сподіваюся на мир. Дякую. Щиро дякуємо, пані Олена. І я е, із задоволенням, ну, наскільки да, можна в цій ситуації, передаю слово пані Ганні Христовій. Дуже дякуємо, пані Ганні, що доєдналися до нас, хоча ви зараз в дорозі, ми знаємо. Е, будь ласка. Дякую, колеги, я надіюся, ви можете почути. Олена, будь ласка, будь ласка. Дякую, Now I'm on the way back to Ukraine in the train of Romania who provided three tickets for Ukrainians, uh, for all Ukrainians who can just show any ID proving their nationality. And this is also just an example, a small but very important one of the role of business Uh, towards refugees and towards people who are seeking for, for the safe place to live. Uh, I'm coming back to Ukraine, and, uh, but before that, I evacuated my mom and my daughter. And uh, I will start with br briefly with just three very small, very small stories. And uh, When we crossed the border uh, by pedestrian crossing, I would, it, it took over five hours. I will never forget first the blue lips of my child, then of purple lips, and then the gray lips. I will remember this face with gray lips for all my life. Secondly, yesterday, the zoo in Kyiv just called to all business Uh, who is still in place in Kyiv to provide any leftovers of the food, any leftovers of the food, anything they could feed the animals because they are simply dying. They're simply dying of hunger. And uh, the third small, the, the, third, the, third, the third short story, but very important. You all need to understand that in cities who are under severe attack now, who are severe bombing, like Kharkiv. Many people with women, with children, they just left the city. And mostly elderly people or people with disabilities are left. These people are not even in a position to go downstairs because the elevators, many elevators are not working. They are not even in a position to get even the bread and to, to, to feed themselves just with the most essential food for surviving. And of course, we can continue and continue such personal stories and whole description of the situation. I am very grateful to Olena Uvarova who provided uh, a, a general overview of where we are and the, the differences between different places in Ukraine. Uh, Now, I must say that I will come to some possible uh, solutions or some possible suggestions to business, how they can be active in this situation. And uh, I'm working for the Council of Europe from 2015, but at this moment, these suggestions will be on my own. I'm not in a position to represent official position of the Council of Europe. But here I must say that uh, the Council of Europe uh, undertakes concrete steps uh, to condemn the aggression for the moment, the military aggression of Russia Federation, for the moment, the membership of Russia Federation in the PACE Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe and Committee of Ministers is suspended, and uh, 
it means that the, the process of withdrawal is ongoing. And this is, of course, will address people of Russia as well. But this is an only way to react on such severe violations of human rights. And uh, now coming to what business uh, should, shall or must do in this situation, first of all, the business shall stop working with Russia Federation. It is absolutely clear that the people in Russia Federation will be uh, also uh, addressed by such, uh, such solutions. But this is for the people of Russia to stop this war. This is our joint responsibility, human rights protection rights still in place. And the war doesn't mean the end of life. Uh, secondly, what is uh, absolutely important now for Ukraine, crucial for Ukraine, is that the constant and uh, uninterrupted uh, delivery of the goods uh, uh, take place to the Western uh, territories of Ukraine, because this is the only way for people to survive and to get an access to the goods. The supermarket are still working, and uh, of course, the goods from the western part of Ukraine can be and are transferring to the uh, eastern part and in Kyiv, uh, uh, the places um, who face the most severe attacks, military attacks. The first point, the third point, is the point of humanitarian support and humanitarian assistance. Uh, here, um, I'm, I'm stating very loudly, and please know this, that national authorities of Ukraine are fully operational. Regional uh, authorities are fully operational and uh, uh, local communities as well. It means that partners are still in place. It means that when you provide humanitarian support, you can get any guarantees that this support will be probably uh, delivered further and it will be under control of Ukrainian government, Ukrainian authorities. Uh, so you, the business who is ready to provide humanitarian support, they can uh, get relevant documents. So it is not the case that you cannot follow the way of this humanitarian support further. The, uh, It's not the good now. In like uh, Chernivtsi, Lviv, Ushgorod, they arrange as uh, uh, you are. Can you hear me? Uh, Can yes. you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the connection is not good. Uh, and uh, yeah, the final point, please, uh, just uh, to be in time. Yeah, thank you. So, so I will. Uh, so the logistics of humanitarian support is organized from all borders with uh, European countries. And uh, uh, I am, uh, I would like, I kindly ask Diolano Varua to share my direct contacts. I will be very glad to do all possible to contact you with all regional authorities who will arrange uh, your humanitarian uh, logistics of your humanitarian support from all borders, meaning Polish, Romanian, Hungary borders, uh, Moldovan, all borders. Uh, and it will be done properly under your control. So you must understand Ukraine, Ukrainians are very well organized now. And it is not the case that this is a total house here. And uh, uh, the first point is that, uh, I think it will be the final point from my side, that you, the business, shall also consider the way to support NGOs who are working on the ground and who are very active, who provide everyday support, who, uh, who um, assess their needs. And uh, these NGOs are reliable, they are effective, and uh, their transfer, money transfer system, grant transfer system is working quite well in Ukraine. 
and uh, so the banking system is working well and such direct transfers direct grants to ngos on the ground could be also of a great support and here i also reiterate that i will share all reliable contacts with you and i believe that you will consider any personal options your personal uh, support that you can organize in your country. At this concrete moment after this meeting, we will try uh, our colleague, my dear colleague from Council of Europe, who is now retired, she is trying to arrange uh, the uh, grant of ambulance from Polish to Lviv, to Lviv Hospital. So I truly kindly ask each of you personally to think what you personally can do to arrange any humanitarian support any other form of support to Ukrainian people, because people shall have at least the, the they shall have the right uh, to survive, at least a chance to survive. Thank you very much. I will stay as long as possible. And again, I kind ask Polena to share my email and to share my personal telephone number. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all support. We really feel it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, dear Anna. Uh, and uh, um, uh, unfortunately, we have not uh, the representative from Nova Posta, Trade Union of Nova Posta, just because uh, uh, he is mobilized to Ukrainian army just now, and uh, he cannot join us just now. Uh, and I would like to give the floor uh, to uh, Svetlana, who represents European Business Association, uh, and uh, who will represent the position of members of European Business Association in Ukraine. Svetlana, please. Uh, thank you, Elena, dear all. Uh, good to see you, really, not in this kind of conditions, but still, uh, we are strong and really Ukrainians are really strong people. Uh, I personally experienced myself uh, the assistance and support provided by uh, neighbor countries because uh, uh, I emergently crossed the border with my two little kids. Uh, all my family left uh, in uh, Kiev neighborhood. So, uh, as Elena already mentioned, the most dangerous and uh, I would say suffered regions in Ukraine is now Mariupol, Kharkiv, Kyiv region, Chernihiv and surroundings. And we really need this humanitarian assistance, which has been already provided and we will need more. Uh, as of business, uh, I must say that uh, EBA proceeds working uh, despite that uh, the fact that uh, all our team is spread. Uh, majority are still in different regions in uh, Ukraine, some of them cross the border uh, and uh, located um, temporarily uh, in European countries. Uh, but uh, we still uh, provide coordination between uh, businesses and government, uh, uh, governmental institutions and different organizations in terms of somehow to organize, uh, organize the needs and the help uh, the business community may provide. Last week, uh, we conducted an express uh, survey among our members about the current business activities and operations in terms of the war. And 17% of our members reported that they proceed working in full time. 16 had limited the geography of their activities. 19% uh, had been forced to close some offices, outlets, branches. Uh, the other 29% uh, of companies are currently out of business. 27 have suspended uh, their activities but want to resume operations and only one of CEOs, 1% of CEOs have plans to close their businesses at all. Uh, of course, the EBA represents mostly big multinational companies, but we also uh, have uh, among our members uh, middle size and uh, small companies, Ukrainian companies. 33% uh, of businesses continue to pay salaries to employees in full, 45% make some additional payments, and only 3% of our members were forced uh, to cut salaries. 1% have to provide unpaid leaves or were forced to lay off staff. To support the employees, 68% uh, of our members paid salaries a month or even more ahead. 
29 reimbursed relocation expenses, at, as it was mentioned. 23% rented accommodation in Western part of Ukraine and 23% uh, did it abroad. 1% uh, of companies ordered insurance for those who continue to go to work. Uh, I have to mention that lots of our members, uh, including companies in um, different industrial committees within the EBA, they are engaged in so-called uh, critical infrastructure. Uh, also, we asked uh, our members if they work with Ukraine, and we have our public um, statement. Uh, and among the respondents, we got uh, only 34% did, even before these critical times, business in or with Russia. And uh, the majority, 31, have already stopped operations, closed offices, uh, stopped investment projects in Russia or with Russia, froze Russian money. Moreover, 14% have suspended their activity and another 34 are currently thinking about it. Uh, again, I would also agree with um, previous speakers uh, that um, it's very hard to have this clear uh, mind right now because we're all on emotions, uh, but still there are no black or whites. Uh, again, uh, EBA have already uh, published our official message to business community to stop doing business with Russia. And uh, uh, Ukrainian authorities are now really thinking about some sanctions, even legislative initiatives uh, about the sanctions for those businesses who deal with the Russian Federation, do business and earn money from that. All businesses try to support Ukraine in these times. And I really want to say huge thanks to each members of EBA and other companies for their consciousness, for their un unity right now. According to our survey, 41% of companies already helped financially and proceed doing this. 35% support employees who defend our country. 31 supply products, their premises, 29 supply services, 16 medicines, 9% means of protections for defense. Every day we receive dozens of questions from our member companies, how they can support our country. Mm -hmm. As of today, uh, about uh, 10.7 billion Ukrainian hryvnias already has been raised for army and humanitarian needs. Uh, according to the information of the National Bank of Ukraine, you know, they have separate accounts, uh, one account to support Ukrainian army, but since lots of organizations, NGOs, and even companies, according to their internal compliance, can't provide money and funding directly to army, uh, they have this humanitarian account as well. Uh, according to our very approximate calculations, uh, for the first week of the war business donated a uh, few billion of hryvnias to support army, territorial defenses, medical institutions in times of the war, uh, and almost the same amount uh, businesses donated not in money, but in different products and services. Last year in the EBA, we launched the first online re uh, so-called reuse center in Ukraine. It was initially um, designed to, to have uh, this second chance for uh, already used facilities in offices or premises like B2B or from B2 NGOs, different organizations, et cetera, et cetera. So now we redesigned this platform and transform it into the platform that helps to collect needed for the country things, medicines, means of protection, et cetera, and offers from business community and other organizations. So I will gladly share this resource uh, with you. So you may also- The final point. Yeah, yeah sure, sure, sure. Uh, that was actually it. That was the final point. Uh, we really would need organized humanitarian rules. Thank you for doing this from Poland already. Uh, with the support of Ukrainian Lukrzalis needs, a business community organize, organized these safety rules, but we would need even more 
because of these uh, dangerous situations with uh, civilians in different regions of Ukraine. So again, thank you very much for international business community and for business in Ukraine for supporting. And let's uh, do it together and help each other. All my contact details will be also shared with um, all of you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, I just quick uh, return to Beata Ferracic and uh, we saw the picture inside Ukraine and now we will try to see the picture outside of Ukraine. Beata, please. Uh, many thanks, Elena. And um, just literally one minute from me and I'll be handing over to Mr. Jarek Rod, who is the executive director responsible for area of sustainability at BNP Paribas Bank Polska. And I, what I just wanted to say is to thank to all the companies that have agreed to share their experience and uh, talk about the efforts they're undertaking, uh, because surprisingly or not, it's not that obvious that companies are ready to speak about uh, actions that they're under, undertaking for a number of reasons. So um, just to thank you once again, because it's important. Uh, Mr. Roth, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beata. Um, let me start with saying that um, we are fully with you. Uh, I'm speaking for our Ukrainian friends. Um, this is very emotional topic, and we we are really, you know, trying to do whatever we can to support you. I will be speaking about some actions done in the bank, but you know, it's even hearing about the experiences that we just had and speaking on the on the business actions it's it's not giving uh, a very big big comfort so uh, nevertheless we, we we feel big responsibility we we feel that we have to do as much as much as we can uh, i will not be speaking actually about the bnp paribas group actions um i mean in, 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 in France, in, in other countries. Although they are very active, they have created the Rescue and Recover Fund, um, donated uh, uh, already 10 million euro to this fund, um, obliging to double all the donations made uh, to this fund from, from the external part and um, using this fund to support the uh, NGOs like uh, Red Cross, uh, uh, Care, or Doctors uh, Without Borders. So this is on the group side. Uh, there is much more, but I will not uh, speak about this. I will not also be speaking about the bank, BNP Paribas Bank Poland employees, because um, we have a lot of volunteers and we do privately as, as much as we can. There were different actions, also slightly coordinated at the bank level in terms of uh, volunteers offering their uh, flats, offering the transportation, offering to supply with, you know, goods, medicines, etc., etc. I will not mention mention this, but we, we, we feel it and, and we have, we have uh, many actions of that kind. So coming back to the BNP Paribas uh, Bank Poland, there are several several actions in different dimensions so let me start with the uh, the financial contribution and the creation of the solidarity fund which was established under the bnp paribas poland foundation the aim of the fund is to of course support uh, uh, ukrainian refugees uh, people who had to you know leave homes um uh, this fund is open externally not only we, we promote this in BNP Paribas group, uh, but also externally. Uh, in this fund, we we declared the uh, bank's contribution being, you know, four times the external donations, and uh, the the use of funds will be also given to uh, NGO, partially, uh, for example, uh, the Foundation Ocalenie, uh, Salvation Foundation. Uh, but also supporting our initiative in the bank that I will mention, I will mention in a second. Uh, as you know, BNP Paribas Group has uh, a bank uh, operating in in Ukraine, and we also support our colleagues 
to make sure that the bank is operating because it's necessary to to provide services to Ukrainian people being in Ukraine and they are uh, operational many branches uh, are operational only except the, the 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 places that were physically destroyed or or uh, are uh, uh, under under attack uh, any other are are working but in terms of those employees we have more than 5000 people and we have declared to support uh, support the all the employees of BNP Paribas group and their families who live in Ukraine if they decide to to move to Poland uh, so we have created the dedicated uh, uh, action support center uh, in this support center uh, we have uh, a 24 7 line mentioning helping you know organizing for the people that are calling uh, and organizing a transportation from the border to the hotels near to the border and then offering the full accommodation and transport transport to the centers our uh, training center and the hotels around uh, to support with all the formalities legal support medical support psychological support covering the basis needs uh, we have already more than 500 people that that we were able to to help to support and and brought from the from the borders then then we have uh, other other activities i will mention the activities of, of the bank towards the bank employees in poland so we have a special dedicated uh, uh, um site on the on our internal uh, uh internet site where we are uh, uh, giving the daily updates on the situation in uh, ukraine we are providing the verified list of uh, ngos uh, and the fundraisers uh, uh, we also have two days of uh, for all the employees two, two days for volunteers to uh, fully paid on top of the leaves to, to support then for our ukrainian employees or the polish employees that have the family in ukraine uh, we are offering extra three days of paid to to try to you know help organize them with their families and friends uh, we are offering and actually organizing the the psychological um, support for all the all the people um, all the all the employees there is some communication on the cyber security part as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe Bruce, very... I'm afraid we'll need to. <laughs> so just, just finishing. Okay, one minute, one more minute. Ap apologies. Then, then for the Ukrainian uh, customers, we have simplified the the process of opening the accounts. It's it's very easy. It was really, really limit that number of documents. There are free withdrawals from the ATMs in the country. There is free deposits and withdrawals in in the branches, uh, countrywise, and we have a dedicated line in Ukrainian language for all, all our Ukrainian customers. And for all customers, there is no fee to transfer money to Ukraine. So I will I will stop here, and you know wishing all the best, keeping and hoping that this terrible war will will end uh, very soon. Slava Ukraini. Thank you very much, you. Mr. Vrat, and thank you for sharing what you are doing. I hope that it also kind of acts as some inspiration and a list of ideas for some other companies also in other countries, because we have to be aware that um, obviously people of Ukraine are not only stopping in Poland, they're moving also to their relatives and um, other places in Europe. So this sort of support is needed not only in Poland, but also across Europe. And now I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Jacek Siatkowski for Tech to the Rescue, which is also a tech for Ukraine, um, who can tell us about um, some more coordinated action by tech companies um, who are currently supporting also Ukraine. Uh, Mr. Siatkowski, over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jacek, and I'm the CEO of Tech to the Rescue. Tech to the Rescue is, uh, is a nonprofit organization which uh, matches tech companies and nonprofits to create digital products together that might solve some of the world's problems. Uh, we operate for two years now, and last year we connected uh, and kickstarted over 50 projects in 14 countries. And as soon as, uh, as the war started, we decided to launch a Tech for Ukraine campaign 
mobilizing uh, tech companies around the world to offer their services for free to nonprofits uh, working with refugees or nonprofits in Ukraine uh, to to build uh, technology solutions to make our whole effort more coordinated and effective. So to give you some examples, uh, uh, so uh, in Poland right now there is an NGO forum. So a collective of over 150 organizations uh, working professionally in the field of humanitarian response. Uh, and they all claim that uh, the most difficult thing to do is coordination. Uh, everyone needs to help urgently and immediately. And it's super difficult to, um, you know, to coordinate activities of that many NGOs. Uh, and this coordination is crucial to not overthrow resources to one place and to miss them in other place. Uh, so, uh, for example, we are building a system that will help these NGOs uh, report their activities and report uh, resources that are needed in different places to make everything more efficient and effective. Uh, another example, uh, yesterday I had a call from uh, people who are, um, who are uh, responsible for, uh, for, for the management for uh, train station reception points in Warsaw. Uh, and there are you know, hundreds of people right now um, uh, in the need of help and hundreds of uh, volunteers. And it's, it's quite difficult to, um, to make sure that there is enough food on one hand and not too much food on, on the other hand, as an example. Uh, if, if the people managing uh, these train station reception points make a call online for people to bring some food for, for the refugees, uh, they usually bring too much. So they called us to, uh, to design and develop the system that might help coordinate these activities uh, and make sure that these resources are not wasted. So these are just the two examples. We are building products in the field of connecting refugees with shelter, uh, in the fields of uh, securing uh, digital proofs of war crimes in Ukraine, uh, in Poland. Uh, we are building uh, chatbots for government to help uh, refugees um, understand uh, where should they go if they get to Poland. Uh, so there are like right now, right now over 40 different projects being, uh, being executed. And so how it works in practice. So we are looking for nonprofit organizations uh, that already know what they need, right? So for example, that might be a need for coordinating volunteers better. So these NGOs should, uh, should reach out to us with an ask for help. Uh, they should report what do they need. Uh, our specialists and our business analysts and digital analysts uh, will talk to them uh, to, uh, to create something like a project brief so uh, a list of requirements that the system should have. And with such a document, we are turning to the group of tech companies in our community that can offer their services for free to build these solutions quickly. Um, for now, like I checked it uh, an hour ago, we have 495 companies ready to help immediately from tomorrow uh, from over 40, 40 countries. So this group of companies is huge uh, and uh, basically right now the, the biggest struggle is to uh, is to find this uh, nonprofits that actually are ready uh, to to start these projects and to implement these solutions because everyone is is busy with uh, with an urgent stuff and immediate help that we need to bring to to people in need um, so i don't want to i don't want to took too much time i, I want to you to understand uh, that uh, and remember that there is tech to the rescue organization we have technology resources to bring to your organizations uh, to help you organize your response in a more effective and scalable way. And uh, one thing you need to do uh, to get this help is to reach out to me or to techtotherescue.org uh, and then fill the form on the website. And then our team um, will, uh, will take care of, of your needs and the whole process. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Shatkowski, for this contribution. Many thanks for sharing. Let me just stress how important it is. Um, it's great that there was a huge response from the society, from individual companies, from individual people. But on one hand, it's great that it's easy to cross the border, um, but it's important to really have it coordinated because it's not just good people that are um, trying to help. It's also a number of uh, organized crimes 
being uh, present and taking the opportunity of the fact that basically there are people crossing the border and then there is bus and just people are shouting that like, okay, I've got five places for Berlin or 10 places for Spain. Uh, unless we coordinate it, unless it's really under control, it will be just a dream space for organized crime to profit. And we know that human trafficking is already a huge issue, not only in Europe. So many thanks, um, Mr. Shevkovsky, for the support. It's extremely important. And, if I can uh, now, add uh, just one thing, uh, which is uh, important to me as well. Um, like we feel a big need to, to coordinate with the public institutions and other like stakeholders on the whole response map as well and uh, it's not uh, easy for now so if you are representing uh, public institutions that are open for collaborating with us and NGOs that we are helping uh, I would be uh, I would be honored to, to have a possibility to, to speak to you and to uh, you know put you on our map so we could uh, we could uh, make our response even more effective. Fantastic many thanks I'm sure that we'll be able to put you in touch with several uh, local governments, but we'll also, also reach out to some of the contacts uh, in the Polish administration. We'll see whether this will respond. Um, so I'll be in touch for sure. And now over to Magda Mitraszewska, who will tell us about the response from uh, ING Group. Uh, Magda, the voice is yours. Hi, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I must say that being uh, at this meeting and hearing all the testimonies and all the information, and also, I, we know that what we do is only a drop in the ocean of needs, but uh, well, we started immediately on the Thursday 24th because we believed that well, local governments and state, they need time to like take action to prepare to organize. So like the real people, the business, the NGOs, they would be the first to respond. So on the same day, we picked an experienced foundation to cooperate with. We cooperate with Humanos Foundation. And what we do? Well, we created a database with flats and rooms and houses that people can share with refugees. And from the beginning, we assumed also that part of the flats we will be renting as a company and sharing with refugees. We organized transports from for Ukrainians from the border into Poland. And our general attitude is that uh, as soon as we take care of of a family of people, then we take care of them the, the whole way. So we um, we support them with transport, accommodation, clothes, food, uh, sometimes finding a job. Uh, we also organize um, some transports from Poland to Ukraine with food, cleaning products, sleeping bags, medicines, whatever is needed. And for those transport transports, we also we are raising money and uh, those initiatives are organized together with our partners with their financial aid. Mm. Right now, there is around 15 people from our 50 people headquarters. So it's like it's a big part of our of our staff that is engaged in, in those activities. Some of them like me full time, some of them part time. So it's uh, it's hard, of course, because as all of you know, it's not like nine to five job and um, and our colleagues that not even engaged are, are, are not engaged in these activities. They took over our regular duties. So they are it's um, it's a lot. And uh, I must say that uh, right now, one of our biggest challenges is that I mean, the, the needs are growing and our strengths are weakening and people are, are tired, are getting tired. So like, I mean, at some point we would need to kind of get go back to our regular business. And it's, it's, it's hard because like our activities, they don't seem to have an end point, right? I mean, when would be the right time to, to, to stop and to like hand over our know-how and our databases, our contacts. I mean, I, I think there would be, there wouldn't be any good time, but at some point we need to do it. And it's, um, it's, 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 it's hard. We want to do it responsibly. And at the same time, our regular business, and my company deals with mortgage loans mostly. Uh, so our regular business is also um, affected right now by both by war, by interest rates, etc. But uh, it's still, I mean, in order to survive as a business, we need to like put some effort also into business. But we still decided to put 
quite a lot of effort in outside the business and it was the right decision. It was the only one that we could take, but um, it's not an easy decision. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, um, we also do like, I, I totally agree with this coordination need because we also, um, we also face that, that we are not an, um, a professional humanitarian aid organization. We are simply people kind of volunteering, but in the company time um, and trying to do it the best we can, but it's like, we are not, we are not professionals in this field. So it's hard and with all this chaos, it's, it's hard to like to be where the, the help is most needed. Um, so yeah, I think it's uh, it it would be it would be it, and um, I really I'm I'm uh, I'm really happy that there is so much of uh, this people movement. But I still hope that the state and local government will quite fast organize themselves better, and we could like join the bigger system of, of organized help. Thank you very much, Magda. And uh, I think I just cannot stress how important it is because. Well, personally, I did actually also seek support from um, ANG uh, because of um, just basically trying to secure some passage and, and help uh, some very concrete people. And um, some of the suggestions, contacts that we were getting from ANG were very, very useful. But like, you know, we all know that it's the role of state and it's just very, um, difficult for us to know that the last several years were wasted simply because the government is trying to, or let's say found um, migration policy not important. So I guess there is also a role for all of us to, um, to put pressure on our governments to, to basically uh, work on solutions that are needed in crisis time to be developed in peaceful times. I mean, there are so many conflicts in the world, unfortunately, that there is plenty to learn from and draw the best practices and prepare. I mean, let's hope for always for the best, but prepare for the worst options. So, um, but uh, many thanks Magda and I will give over the voice to Gana Szwaczka from Ukraine, Slovakia, SOS, which also will talk to us about NGOs and companies collaboration, just this time uh, with a view from Slovakia. And it will be also interesting to hear how it works there and uh, what can be done also in terms of helping companies to address really um, all the challenges. It's great that everybody wants to help, but there are so many human rights, human rights risks involved in various aspects of this help that it's important also later on we'll be addressing it, how we can provide some guidance, how we can provide some advice and toolkits and stuff. But Gana, over to you now. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, dear Beata, for representing us and our um, NGO here. It is a great pleasure and uh, uh, a great chance to, to talk about what's going on in Slovakia according to business and human rights uh, as a reflection of this crisis um, response we all are facing uh, now. I really I do represent two entities which works um, uh, within one uh, uh, team management. Uh, we have a civic association in Slovakia, Smespolu, and charity fund in Ukraine called Ukraine Slovakia SOS. And our charity fund uh, since 2017 is registered from Ministry of Social Affairs, Ukrainian Ministry of Social Affairs, as an official recipient of international humanitarian aid. So uh, when we all wake up 24 of February with this such a terrible news, uh, we realized that we are only one uh, for right that moment who may provide full logistic from Slovakia to Ukraine uh, uh, formally uh, uh, by using our our um, and Ukrainian entity as a final recipient as a as a recipient of uh, humanitarian aid provided from Slovakia and distributing our humanitarian aid among the final beneficiaries in Ukraine. And that was really changed our plans and uh, whatever job we, we supposed to do before and plan to do before. And since the first night we were in the border and transferring the medical suppliers for, for Ukrainian hospitals, uh, for right 
right now moment, we transfer already 720 ton camion, 720 ton trucks from uh, Bratislava and Kosice uh, to uh, Ushgarad and from Ushgarad to, um, to the frontline area, uh, such as uh, Kharkiv, Mariupol and Kyiv. Uh, I would say that, uh, yeah, if you're coming back to our main topic, the business for one of the, one of the fastest institutions, social institution, who uh, uh, offer their help to us as an NGO. Uh, we have uh, two huge, well-equipped uh, warehouses in, in uh, Bratislava and Kosice for free from DHL. They they offer us their, that 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 the way how they contribute to our humanitarian aid project. We received so many uh, offers from different companies such as IKEA, Alza SK, uh, Alza Czech Republic, who are ready to do everything. They want to they want to uh, donate the items. They're ready to pack them. They're ready to deliver them. They they realize that. Uh, uh, there is no time for extra communication and they're doing that really fast and very, very flexible according also our um, capacities and logistics. Uh, what is interesting that many, many humanitarian aid supplies, for example, one of the factory which produce medical supplies for uh, first kit uh, and urgent medical aid, uh, they produce specific bandages for, uh, for big uh, injuries. Um, which there are a lot of Ukrainians, unfortunately, having now, they offer since the beginning uh, such a kind of program of cooperation. They not only want to give us bandages and uh, ask, uh, asking us to deliver them to Ukraine, they also uh, are ready to uh, employ as much as possible Ukrainian refugees in their factory. So it is, I think, very like a prominent example to show how quick and how, um, let's say, comprehensive the, uh, uh, the offers which we receive from business and uh, I really appreciate and ready to cooperate in such a, such a kind of matter, not only for collecting uh, material items and deliver them to Ukraine, but also helping our refugees with integration. As you maybe know, we have more than 20,000 uh, refugees uh, coming to Slovakia. Yes, not all of them are staying here. More, many of them uh, uh, going further to Czech Republic or to some other countries. But uh, there is a, is a huge challenge for our government, for, for uh, many, uh, for municipality, by the way, and for our uh, NGO sector to deal with this, with, with this, uh, uh, very uh, like uh, with, with many uh, uh, requests that we are facing uh, from this very vulnerable group now. Uh, particular our um, our NGO are helping now with. Uh, we are working as a bridge because we all are Ukrainians. We may speak Ukrainian and Slovak language, so we are actually uh, helping them to communicate. Uh, 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 with uh, local authorities, with the kids and the kids garden, with the schools and with their potential employers. And again, as, my, as well as with the humanitarian aid, uh, their potential employers, we, we receive more offers from Slovakian companies who are ready to employ our people uh, for a while than actually uh, um, demands from our refugees to work, which I do understand because now it's just a few days they're here and they need they need some time to find out where they are and to get ready for the next steps. In many ways, it is also complicated because it is very hard to, you know, most of our refugees are women and they have a kids and they need kids to be in the school or kids garden to, to have free time to work. So they want to work, but they cannot uh, start it uh, as they cannot, uh, they cannot uh, arrange uh, this um, uh, educational uh, uh, service for their kids. Service. And this is uh, actually very, very big uh, also uh, demand and uh, a lot of work to do because unfortunately in Slovakia is not so easy to have a free place even in regular not crisis time for, for the for the child to to enter to to the kids garden mostly but to the school as well. Uh, uh, Gana, if I could ask you kind of for the final statement apologies for 
excuse me, you want me to- You could to, just kind of, yes, yeah. uh, because so just, afraid we need to- Yeah, so final statement, uh, business responsible, very quick and very effective. Uh, besides of uh, communicating with uh, um, regular entities, with, with, with um, like a separate companies, we also communicate with American Chamber. I do appreciate that they are our partners uh, here in Slovakia and they deliver their aid through us. So many, many business agencies uh, all, and units are, um, uh, uh, providing their help in more, let's say, organized way. And uh, uh, well, uh, the next the next step what we are willing to um, to work together with business is our refugee integration. And here is a huge risk about labor exploitation because there are many many businesses, of course. Uh, uh, are responsible, but there are some of them no, and they understood that there is this kind of very high skilled uh, um, um, people arriving to the country, and they they um, uh, it is a it is a huge risk. They can be uh, exploited, and they can be uh, arranged in a not uh, appropriate uh, legal labor contracts and condition and that's what we are we, we are planning to 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 deal with um in a short time perspective fantastic many thanks Gana, for sharing this actually you flagged up a number of issues which i think are currently very important for the region because i think also in poland already we have this discussion that because of the nature of the refugee group that is coming the support uh, probably the companies will be also facing the same support uh, the same issue around uh, perhaps providing some support to their workers or increased support to their workers uh, regarding care for children, or this will be some things that many of them will need to face. Unfortunately, also, as you mentioned, there are some reports, luckily incidental, but still there are some reports of, for example, somebody, you know, just even taking people for a day to you know, support the work in pizzeria or some places like this, and kind of at the end of the day, of the end, end of the working day, telling that they will um, that they, they are just not useful, and then not even paying them for the day. So um, there is also this issue around this. Yes, Gana, do you want? To, I forgot to, to mention something? very important that the status which they they have in Slovakia now uh, allow them legally work because you know as uh, for example people with asyl status they don't they, they are not open for um, uh, for possibility to be officially employed here. But the refugees what uh, what arrived who arrived to Slovakia from to. 24 February, receiving the IDs which allow them officially work. And they provide very flexible uh, regulation that you just need, simply need to announce within seven days, since the moment yep. when you're officially uh, um, uh, employed uh, about the place where you are working. Mm -hmm. And we really appreciate that the Slovakian of... government provides very, I think, very um, friendly and very reliable uh, yes. condition for us. Uh, just to mention, um, as far as I know, there is one of the EU regulations coming into force as well. I mean, being applied right now. And apologies because of the events of the last um, hours. I just kind of wasn't able to double check that. But as far as I understand, there is also EU legislation which is currently applied when it comes to this temporary um, uh, status in the EU because similar uh, regulations that Ghana has mentioned are also being kind of introduced also in Poland and as far as I know in several other countries. So it's enough to for the person to start working and then just be this fact be registered within seven days. Um, also, um, as long as you have a stamp that you have crossed the border in Poland uh, to Poland or other countries after the 24th or from the 24th of February, um, you have access, you are you, you are able to um, get ID and so on. It's still, um, um, I mean, as mentioned, some special legislation is still being developed. So it's, I mean, it will probably will clarify itself in the next days because as Olga actually just mentioned in, um, in the chat, for many people, it's still difficult to kind of understand what is, what are the rules on the ground. Um, so obviously there is, more needed to be done by the state. Uh, but now um, I would like to move on apologies because we're, we are running a little bit behind. I would like to give the floor to uh, Ms. Sarsha MacLeod, uh, the chair of the UN Working Group on the Use of Mercenaries. Sarsha, and apologies because I probably just again mispronounced your name, uh, but the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Beta. It's Sorge. Yeah, it's, uh, but in, in, in the great scheme of things, it's not very important. Um, I'd like to, first of all, thank Beta and Olena for inviting me today. Uh, um, I wish, uh, it I, wish uh, I was seeing everyone under uh, better circumstances. As Beta already mentioned, I, uh, I'm here in my capacity as chair of the UN Working Group on the, the Use of Mercenaries. Um, and um, I, it's a mandate under the UN um, special procedures. And before I, I talk about the specific challenges uh, from the security side of things, um, I, oh, that's not me. Nope. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I'd managed to share something. No. Um, uh, the, the, the special procedures issued a strong statement a couple of a couple of weeks ago, um, and we have been very clear that we're outraged by the aggression um, uh, uh, exercised by by Russia on the so sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine, and we're we're profoundly concerned about everyone's uh, safety. Um, and of course, we urge uh, urge all of the actors to respect international law, especially the laws and customs of war, um, and ultimately. To, to end um, the hostilities. Now, the, the statements that I'm, I'm going to refer to today, I will put into the, into the, 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 the chat. Um, from the, the, the security side of things, um, I think there are two issues um, that um, are of particular um, concern and of relevance when we're thinking about business and, and armed conflict. Um, the first, um, we've already been hearing some of the, the, the issues um, around uh, borders. Um, the working group in uh, 2019 published a report on, uh, sorry, 2020 published a report on um, the use of private military and security companies um, uh, at, at borders and also in relation to immigration uh, 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 detention. But um, I think um, it's really important um, for all actors who are uh, using uh, private military and security companies and who are outsourcing to private military and security companies. Now that's states, it's business actors, but it's also humanitarian actors. They need to be aware um, of the heightened human rights risk. Beta already mentioned, you know, that there are these um, criminal actors who, who are involved in at, at the border already. Um, but all of the all of the clients of these uh, PMSCs need to be aware of the increased human rights risks at borders. They need to ensure that when they are outsourcing or contracting with private military and security companies, that um, they are ensuring that human rights standards are um, enforced, um, that there is proper, that, that they do their proper human rights due diligence, but also that the, the private military and security companies do their, 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 their human rights um, due diligence. Um, and that means that there needs to be um, proper oversight and, and, and regulation of these actors. Of course, that's always difficult in an, you know, when, there's a, when there's an evolving situation that's going on, but, but you know, this, they are so, it's so important um, uh, one way that uh, that uh, that could be done is to ensure that you only use ICOCA certified um, private military security companies, for example. So those are companies that have certification from the International Code of Conduct Association. Um, they they are certified as having good corporate governance standards and uh, complying with human rights and IHL um, standards. That's one way that uh, clients could could ensure uh, human rights. Uh, uh, compliance. Um, I think there's there's also um, issues around um, the, the use of new technologies at borders. Um, and that's something that uh, clients do need to be uh, do need to be aware of. Um, how how um, is biometric data being managed, for example? Um, it's something that has to be has to be borne in borne in mind. And then the second issue, which I think is, um, it is connected to business in, in, in armed conflict. And that's the, the, the issue of, of mercenaries um, uh, being, being um, engaged in armed conflicts. Now, um, we, uh, in the working group, we have not yet issued a specific, any specific um, communication or press statement in relation to Ukraine, but we did release um, a statement last week on the general, our, our, our general concerns um, about the increasing and growing use of mercenaries in, in armed conflicts on a, on a global scale. Um, and um, 
we're concerned about that because whenever these actors are in, involved or come into armed conflicts, the um, the um, the risk of the, the 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 conflict being prolonged is is um, is very high. So the, the the conflict they have no they have no incentive to to shorten the conflict because they have financial uh, motivation. Um, the risks of human rights and IHL violations um, taking place are also greatly increased with uh, with these actors. Um, they're very difficult to um, identify. They don't have the chains of commands that the regular armed forces have. And so when it comes to, in, to accountability for human rights violations or war crimes, it becomes extremely, extremely um, difficult. So, um, uh, we are. It's something that we are um, extremely concerned about, um, and uh, we ask um, all actors in armed conflicts not to uh, to to use uh, mercenaries or mercenary-related actors. Um, and I think that's probably my five minutes. So I will I will stop there. But I'll put I'll put the reports and 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 statements in in the chat. And thank you again for the the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very much, Sarcha, and <laughs> and uh, basically, thank you very much for sharing it, and also for sending, uh, for sharing later on the links to, to the reports. It's very important, and I think it's more important because uh, when I've last checked, the problem is actually that there are very, very few companies in our region that actually are members of the ICOC, and that's incredibly um, worrying. Also because there is very little support or like really active support from the states, uh, even when it comes to requiring this sort of certification for the companies that would provide security services um, for um, governmental um, or, um, buildings and so on. Um, now I would like to hand over to Ella Skibenko from Business and Human Rights Resource Center, who will be able to provide us, I think, with um, quite a nice overview of the company's positions. Um, so, Ella, um, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Beata, um, and good afternoon, uh, dear participants. Uh, I would like to share with you what uh, the Business and Human Rights Resource Center has been doing in response to the conflict. Um, since the Russian invasion on the 21st of February, uh, we have been closely monitoring the situation and uh, the private sector's response. Uh, as set out in the UN guiding principles, uh, in situations of armed conflict, uh, business should conduct enhanced uh, human rights due diligence to identify, prevent, and uh, mitigate uh, heightened risks and uh, also adopt a conflict-sensitive approach. And uh, obviously companies need to do it because of the severe risk of uh, gross human rights abuses. Uh, businesses must also avoid uh, contributing to violations of international humanitarian law. Uh, so for this reason, we invited uh, 206 companies operating or investing in Ukraine or Russia to respond to questions about their human rights due diligence related to their operations or investment in Russia or Ukraine. And uh, the purpose of this survey is to <clears throat> increase transparency of business human rights due diligence practices related to the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine, including gaps and examples of good practice. Um, under the UN uh, guiding principles, companies also have a responsibility to share information about how they uh, address risks and impacts with external stakeholders as part of their uh, human rights due diligence. And uh, this is even more important in high risk circumstances. Uh, so what questions are we asking companies? Uh, first of all, we would like to know um, how they are assessing risks since they are supposed to enhance their human rights due diligence in situations of armed conflict. We are asking what concrete measures they are taking to do so. Uh, we are also asking them about mitigating risks and uh, tracking effectiveness. For example, uh, we would like to know what measures a company or its subsidiary uh, is taking to ensure that its business relationships, products, services, operations, and other actions uh, do not contribute to Russian military activities or occupation in Ukraine. Um, finally, we are asking them about exercising leverage 
And here we would like to know if companies or their subsidiaries are taking any other actions to promote respect for humanitarian law, uh, human rights, democracy, or peace in Ukraine. We also um, added specific questions for tech companies and companies from the finance and banking sector. Um, additional questions for social media and other platform companies, for example, include a question about steps they are taking to uh, prevent the spread of misinformation and disinformation. Uh, telecoms uh, companies and internet providers are asked about uh, steps they are taking to maintain connectivity and prevent internet and communication shutdowns in Ukraine. Um, we've asked companies to provide their responses by the 18th of March, and we plan to make company responses uh, publicly available on our website, uh, which receives uh, 3 million visitors per year. And we will also share them through our weekly update, uh, which is sent to 20,000 people worldwide. And we will note uh, which companies did not respond. Uh, finally, we have also published a guidance for companies operating in conflict affected um, contexts. It's based on the materials developed by the Geneva Center for Security uh, Sector Governance and the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, the guidance is um, some sort of, a, of an introduction to good practice uh, that includes eight points. Uh, such as, for example, um, being aware of the potential for liability in relation to international humanitarian law or um, ensuring that company operations, actions or personnel uh, do not violate international humanitarian law or intensify uh, violence in conflict prone um, regions or uh, for instance, having a clear exit strategy, even if the company does not intend to withdraw. Um, th this guidance is available on our website and I'll share um, the link in the chat now. Thank you. Fantastic, many thanks Ella and apologies because we had a bit of a uh, conflicting stuff. So now let me hand over to Salome. Uh, Sorabishvili, who is the executive director at the Global Compact Network Georgia, uh, to speak about the Georgian experience and reaction of Georgian companies to the Russian uh, invasion. Many thanks, Salome. Uh, uh, Beata, thank you very much. And thanks to Elena for organizing this event. It's, it's very important. Uh, and um, I, I cannot start my speech without uh, saying these words. Uh, Slava Ukraine, here I am Slava. Uh, I represent, as Beata mentioned, uh, the UN Global Compact Network in Georgia. Uh, we unite 121 members uh, as of today. Uh, most of them are companies, um, but these 121 members are only in Georgia. Of course, uh, uh, our network is represented in uh, 69 countries and uh, including in Ukraine and several of our colleagues from the Ukrainian network, they managed to cross the border to Poland, but some of them are still remaining in, in Kiev. Uh, the war of Ukraine and Russian aggression uh, is uh, a full-scale military invasion of the Ukrainian territory. The human rights abuses that we are now witnessing um, is a violation of every written or unwritten law regulations and rules of conduct. Uh, my country, Georgia, is uh, familiar with the Russian aggression. Uh, the war and occupation of our sovereign territories in 90s and also in 2008 by the Russian uh, militaries uh, was something that we had to experience as well and we're still experiencing. Uh, this has to stop and Russia and Putin must be stopped and we the Georgian people stand with the Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. Uh, the responsibility of business to respect human rights, especially in cases of armed conflict, uh, is uh, crucial, of course, and business needs to follow the rules as set in the internationally recognized standards, such as the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, and it, as it was mentioned in the previous pitch, Business must not either violate or contribute or be linked to the human rights violations that are happening now in Ukraine. And enterprises need to respect the standards of the international humanitarian law. 
uh, bes besides the responsibility to actually prevent the human rights abuses, I do believe that the company shall take the measures and responsibility in terms of uh, humanitarian efforts towards Ukrainian people and uh, the Georgian uh, companies have been quite active in this direction and I want to share some of the examples of what they have been doing. Um, well, uh, the dairy business uh, on the one hand has been um, quite actively uh, declining the offer uh, of the Russian Federation to export goods, uh, dairy products to the Russian market. Uh, National Bank of Georgia uh, and the Georgian financial sector has been closely complying with the sanctions imposed uh, to the Russian business and Russian oligarchs by the EU, United States, UK, Japan, and other democratic states. Uh, private companies um, uh, also established uh, uh, funds for um, support and recovery uh, for the humanitarian assistance of the Ukrainian people. And more than 10 million was uh, um, uh, collected already by the private sector. Uh, free of charge uh, placement at, and accommodation and also food was provided to the Ukrainians uh, who are living in Georgia uh, by the uh, private sector, hospitality uh, uh, sector. Uh, free medical service was, is also available to the uh, Ukrainian people here in Georgia. Um, also, um, uh, the uh, telecommunication business uh, um, has been actively promoting free calls and providing free calls to Ukraine uh, for the next three months. Uh, and um, uh, the um, Georgian Post uh, has been uh, providing um, uh, for free uh, um, the service of sending parcels by the individuals to Ukraine. Uh, free courses were also offered to Ukrainians by the academic institutions and also the free public transport is available in Georgia for, for the Ukrainians. The Enterprise Georgia is also very actively um, been um, collecting uh, the uh, goods and products uh, from uh, uh, Georgian companies uh, and together with the Georgian Post sending those uh, to uh, Ukraine. Um, on, the, on the global level, uh, United Nations um, Office uh, for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs and also the United Nations Global Compact has jointly developed a business guide for the Ukraine humanitarian cri crisis. And we are actively promoted, promoting this uh, uh, with business sector in Georgia and also throughout the world. Um, we have also um, been actively communicating, not, not only us as the Global Compact, but uh, the uh, companies in Georgia had very active communication campaign in this regard, and they have been incentivizing other companies to um, uh, cooperate and assist together the Ukrainian uh, people. Um, some of the companies have also been offering uh, the temporary job opportunities to the Ukrainian nationals. Um, there is, of course, um, a lot more that can be done, and we have been very, um, at, we are in very active communication with the companies because uh, one, one thing is to kind of uh, react to, to this uh, um, uh, situation, but it, it needs to be a long term, uh, and it needs to, our support needs to also um, be provided on the, on the next stages of the recovery from, from the conflict. And I do hope that the, re the recovery will, will be, uh, the recovery stage will start very soon. Um, we, 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 we will continue to work uh, and continue to mobilize business here on the ground, but also on a regional level uh, as the UN Global Compact. And um, uh, if there is uh, anything that we can, if there are any further ideas of how we can uh, support, we would be more than happy to engage. Uh, our Ukrainian network now, which will, is based temporarily in Poland, they are are um, going to uh, register um, a, an entity um, and create a fund, and they will also collect financial resources to uh, help the Ukrainian people from, uh, from their side um, and also assist the recovery process. 
Uh, I do hope that uh, the war in Ukraine and the violence against the Ukrainian people will end soon. Uh, and um, the only thing I can say, Slava Ukraine and Hero Heroium Slava. Thank you very much, Salma. And I think many of us um, joined this wish. And um, thank you for sharing this uh, info about the situation and galvanization of efforts in Georgia. And I think it's important to stress that a number of the examples that are given from specific countries, uh, a number of those issues, uh, a number of those initiatives are actually present across the region. So please bear in mind that um, what you're hearing, it's probably more widespread. Um, and I think it's important um, because what we see is really, I don't know whether it's unprecedented, but for I think for us, it's very um, uplifting to see such mobilization of business for good. And we just hope that it will continue, that it's not just the first week or two weeks, but that this support and engagement and the willingness to assist uh, people who had to very quickly change their lives actually continues beyond this first um, moment. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to Yerney Czernic, um, uh, Yerney Letna Czernic, Professor of Constitutional and Human Rights Law from uh, New University in Slovenia, who will actually address the issue of divestment um, from Ukraine. We had already some some posts on it. So we, we kind of made some references earlier in the speeches. And I think it will be great that Yerney can kind of finish off this first part of statements with, um, with his uh, analysis, unfortunately very brief, and then we'll move to the comments and to the discussion. I'm afraid that we'll keep you a little bit beyond, um, well, 1 p.m. or 2 p.m., but uh, 2 p.m., I mean, uh, Ukrainian time, uh, but I hope that you'll excuse us for that. So, uh, Yerne, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Beata. Uh, hello to everybody. Thank you, Olena. I'm bad for organizing this event. I think it's uh, uh, super impressive uh, what you have uh, managed to put together in a very short time. Uh, we all admire, Olena, your uh, courage in this uh, difficult uh, time. I'm, uh, I'm honored to, to have been working with you in the past uh, year or so on uh, business human rights in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, yeah, uh, in the last uh, few days, in the last uh, weeks since uh, February 24th, we have been witnessing uh, disinvestment and disengagement of uh, mostly Western companies uh, from uh, Russian market. And I'll try to address this in my short uh, uh, input uh, uh, in today's uh, webinar. Um, this disinvestment and disengagement, uh, of course, has not been widespread. No, it's much more common and uh, systematic in the US, uh, UK, and most of uh, EU member states, but uh, as far as I have noticed, and I'm following this quite closely, you know, the further east, uh, east we go, also within the EU member states, the, the willingness and also ability of companies to disinvest uh, and uh, disengage uh, from Russian Federation has been uh, uh, weaker than perhaps in US and uh, in, in UK. Uh, that, of course, uh, has uh, its own reasons. Uh, uh, Central and Eastern European companies, uh, they are more involved uh, uh, in the Russian markets, whereas in some US and UK companies, you know, the, the share of their annual income, the Russian markets has uh, in the past years been from, from one to, to, uh, to 10%. Then we have also some companies in, uh, in Central Eastern Europe, uh, which uh, you know, generate a quite large part of their annual revenue from the Russian market, for example, the largest Slovenian corporation, uh, Kirka Pharmaceutical, last year uh, generated uh, uh, more than 20% of their annual revenue from Russian uh, market. And um, uh, that perhaps also explains what, why that company perhaps has been more reluctant to, to disinvest and disengage from, uh, from Russian market. But more importantly, when we talk about disengagement uh, or the need for disengagement from Russian market, I mean, the main question is, uh, what are the reasons you know, for this uh, early systematic drive uh, of uh, exit of Western companies from Russian market? Uh, and of course, what will be the uh, longer eff effect and whether this could also you know, impact the, 
business human rights standard uh, standards in, uh, in Russian Federation, but also beyond. Uh, those of us who, who have been active in the Central Eastern Europe uh, in business human rights, we know that uh, even before the start of aggression, the business human rights standards uh, in Russia, but also elsewhere in Eastern Europe, have not been such, so developed as uh, at many more developed economies of global north countries in Europe, but also uh, beyond the uh, you know the business environment uh, in Eastern Europe has its own particularities. You know uh, businesses which have invested uh, at Russian uh, Russian market. Uh, you know perhaps they have taken greater risks uh, than in comparison when one invests uh, uh, at the German market, for example. Uh, those risks have included. Uh, weak rule of law, weak institutions, you know, also uh, quite widespread uh, relations of labor rights. Also, the, the field was uh, quite weak, um, quite weak uh, also before the, the aggression, uh, but the, the, the disinvestment, disengagement since uh, February 24th is quite, uh, is quite extraordinary because it, it has been quite systematic, at least in the West, you know, companies from extractive industry also from uh, retail, food and beverage uh, industry. We have heard yesterday, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Pepsi have finally decided to, to close shop uh, uh, in, in Russian, uh, Russian Federation. And uh, the question is uh, whether one can ascribe this, uh, this ex exits to, to respect to, uh, for business human rights or there are some other reasons. Uh, and the answer to that is, uh, is uh, complex and it's not a, it's not a you know, uh, one, one answer, there, there are multi-layer responses here as well. And one reason, for, of course, is connected to sanctions, you know, to economic sanctions imposed by uh, many countries of Global North, many regional organizations. And it seems companies uh, do not want to get involved in uh, any risks, uh, you know, to violate sanctions either by US or by EU, UK and other uh, countries, so they are, you know, the regulatory environment in their home states is a bit different. You know, it's perhaps more risky uh, to do business uh, uh, with uh, uh, with Russia. Then one could um, also ascribe, uh, uh, you know, reasons for this investment to to reputational risks. You know, companies are increasingly concerned to what their consumers consumers will, you know, think at uh, their home markets or more important markets there engaged uh, in uh, that perhaps uh, uh, explains the exit you know, of companies uh, active in the food and beverage uh, uh, industry uh, uh, sector uh, because they are pre the pressure you not know, to exit is quite it's quite high you know the, the markets in a, in a global north uh, uh, countries as we have seen from you know following financial financial uh, media you know the the headlines are uh, in the center of uh, of uh, reporting of uh, Financial Times, you know, other uh, other Bloomberg and other financial uh, uh, financial media. Then the third reason, perhaps, uh, why why companies are are exiting, is that uh, of course uh, uh, they want to protect uh, the rights of their employees. We have seen quite extraordinary extraordinary efforts by some companies, you know, to to bring their employee, employees from Russia. You know, uh, uh, you know, companies hiring. Also, private military uh, uh, corporations, security corporations, to to exit their uh, their workers, uh, and uh, companies have been uh, perhaps more concerned about you know respect for human rights in their global supply uh, supply uh, chains. Uh, one thing one has to note here is that due diligence, uh, which we know here in the EU, you know, uh, which uh, some companies and some uh, member states uh, have introduced in the past years has not been fully translated to the Russian market. Only uh, a, sh a small proportion of Russian companies have uh, conducted due diligence. <laughs> and also a small proportion of uh, foreign investors you know, have uh, conducted uh, due diligence uh, when doing business in the Russian, Russian market. Uh, so so th those are the three reasons. And perhaps also the fourth reason, which is also quite important, is the, the change in the rule of law, rule of law environment in Russia since uh, 24th of February. Now we have heard reports that the Russian government has announced you no know, efforts of uh, uh, measures of nationalizations. It has frozen investments, for example, of uh, BP in the large uh, Russian state-owned company uh, Rusnet. Now BP had or has uh, 
uh, more than 20% share in that, uh, in that uh, company. Uh, rule of law is not, uh, is not there anymore uh, or it's even weaker than it was before. And that, uh, that's why the companies want to minimize the risk in the Russian Federation by exiting or by uh, you know, uh, disengaging with, with the Russian Federation. Just uh, the last, uh, last point I'll, I'll make here. What does this tell us for uh, business human rights in the Russian Federation, Ukraine, but also beyond in Central Eastern Europe? Can we expect uh, you know, uh, strengthening of standards of business human rights? Uh, I think the, the short answer to that is uh, we'll have to wait. We'll have to wait how this uh, evolves. Uh, I'm not sure that current environment of disengagement and diseng uh, the disinvestment from Russian, uh, Russian Federation can have a uh, you know, direct positive impact on the business and human rights standards uh, uh, in Russian Federation, uh, whether those companies who exited when they decide to return to Russian Federation, whether they will uh, ask uh, you know, for stricter or uh, stronger business and human rights uh, standards, whether they will you know, uh, introduce more, more uh, effective due diligence uh, standards in their global supply chains in the Russian uh, Federation. I think this is also a connection of uh, uh, consequence of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of aggression. It's not, a, it's, at the moment, it doesn't seem to be, uh, to be uh, to be just uh, in a consequence or uh, consequence of improvement of business human rights standards in Russian Federation. It's a consequence of a general situation uh, concerning Russian Russian uh, Federation. But it is it is hope it is hope that uh, that this uh, exits or disengagement with the Russian market will also bring about positive change in the respect for human rights uh, uh, in Russian business environment. Fantastic. Many thanks, Yerne, for, and sorry for giving you the task of uh, talking to such an important issue in such a short time. Um, I note the questions that are appearing in the, uh, in the chat, but I first would like to give the floor, before we move to discussion, I first would like to give the floor to our commentators, uh, particularly that I think it will follow very nicely um, on what uh, Yerne and Kind of the directions that we are going right now. So let me give the floor to Ron Popper, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Global Business Initiative on Human Rights. Um, Ron, the floor is yours. Thank you, Beata. And, and first of all, from my own personal viewpoint, and as, well, speaking also as, as the son of uh, uh, refugees from, from the former Czechoslovakia, I, I'd like to express my deep sadness, uh, dismay, anger, um, at the Russian invasion of Ukraine and its terrible consequences. So I think um, a number of points of, of, that I would have liked to have raised have already been raised by, in, by the last few speakers in particular. Uh, so I, I would just like to give my perspective on where multinationals are coming from, um, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Russia and, and Belarus. And, and, Belarus. Um, and then, um, maybe one or two challenges. Uh, so I'll be pretty brief, Beata. Um, I've been monitoring the uh, statements and activities of multinationals over the last couple of weeks. And uh, um, my overview is, is never going to be as, as um, scientific as, as that being prepared by the Business and Human Rights Resource Center. But what I have noticed uh, is, First of all, a number of multinationals doing business in Russia and Belarus have either suspended or halted business, as the previous speaker said, or they've taken action in line with sanctions, or they're seeking to uh, avoid any reputational risks or consumer boycotts, uh, or they've taken no action, uh, and they've avoided mentioning Russia in public statements for fear of presumably of offending their their paymasters in Russia. And I've, I've read some pretty disgraceful public statements by uh, uh, international CEOs, uh, which have seriously irritated me. Um, or uh, some of the companies uh, are hiding behind the lack of sanctions, uh, hoping to avoid that any major disruption, uh, hoping to avoid any major disruption of their business. I think also companies uh, have got, and one eye on what happens afterwards. 
Uh, and I think they've also got another eye on if they're um, active in other international markets, which are riven by conflict or even war, um, what their business partners are going to be thinking about them in those other areas um, if they pull out um, of, of the Russian market. Um, so I, I think there's, there's a lot of calculation going on um, in boardrooms and among executive management about how they will be perceived elsewhere um, for future investment. So I think that's a point worth making. Um, on the other hand, companies do have a duty of care, as Olena and, and, and Beata were saying uh, at the outset. They do have a duty of care. They want to protect their assets, their investments. Uh, they want to safeguard the welfare, health and security of their people. Um, and they're seeking to supp maintain supply chains and, and business relationships, as I say, also for when this terrible war is over. A couple of remarks and maybe a challenge about enhanced due diligence. Um, I agree entirely with, with the quotes that have been made from the United Nations Guiding Principles on, on business and human rights that uh, companies really do need to do enhanced due diligence. They need to know when they are uh, or if they are likely to um, uh, cause or contribute to or even be directly linked to um, negative human rights impacts. And, and there is this need for enhanced due diligence. Um, but I have a challenge and uh, it, companies have been working on, international companies have been working on uh, the UNGPs and implementing respect for human rights uh, in their processes, policies, et cetera, for, for 11 years now. Um, Enhanced due diligence. Uh, very often wars and conflicts can be foreseen. Sometimes they're no surprise. Um, and responsible companies should have been doing their enhanced human rights due diligence following the 2014 invasion and annexation of Crimea. Um, we already had a foretaste of this of the horror uh, that you are experiencing now. So was that enhanced due diligence done? Um, I suspect in many cases not. I suspect that uh, the enhanced due diligence in this theater of war, um, as in others like Myanmar um, or other controversial areas like China, uh, is only done when um, the chips are down when, when companies really feel that they have to do it. Uh, and it's very often last minute. It's very often unsatisfactory. Um, so I'm hoping that companies do learn from these experiences from Crimea, from Myanmar and elsewhere. And that if they didn't do enhanced due diligence in good time, um, I've heard they, I hope they've learned their, their key lessons. Um, unfortunately, failure to do enhanced due diligence often comes at a cost uh, to people um, rather than to the companies. Finally, um, a, a challenge to, to the international companies as well. Um, much more support is needed to help the victims of this war. Um, I look at the company statements. And I see the sums that are being donated, the sums that are being pledged by international companies. And I think, yes, that seems okay. And then I think again, um, I, I, th I think the sums, that, sums of money that are being donated uh, are very low. I, I say to myself, you guys earned this amount today before breakfast. That's, that's, that's what you're donating. Um, I think there's, a need for greater generosity in the face of uh, this barbarism uh, and its consequences. And I know uh, there are many theatres of war which also deserve attention by corporations as well as states, obviously, and, and, and civil society. But I, I do think that companies um, need to step up and be 
a lot more generous in general uh, than they are being to date. So those are just a, a couple of challenges um, and a couple of thoughts at this stage. Thank you very much, Ron. I think it was very nice. Um, it's a very comprehensive sum up of also what was said. And um, I think I do share what you've said also about you know, the amount of money or kind of the willingness or not willingness to, to withdraw and uh, what actually is influencing those decisions. I just wrote kind of in response to um, Marina that what we are seeing also is that people who are directly invo involved in trying to arrange support in trying to arrange some aid and so on and that are trying to tackle the issues around relocation or uh, others that they are kind of much more forthcoming and open and willing to much to do much more, much more. Uh, whereas when it comes to the top management, um, I mean there is much more hesitation. And in a way, I can understand there are different levels of responsibility and so on. It's um, as I said at the beginning, it's not black and white. But um, I have to say that it still comes a bit surprising for us that companies on one hand taking decision to suspend operations, but still is not willing to talk about it openly. It's kind of, it's okay to post a statement on the website and perhaps just put it in the commentary somewhere on the LinkedIn when somebody asks directly, but not necessarily to go kind of fully, fully informed kind of with full steam um, openly about the decisions and thinking behind it. And, 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 and following up from that, Beata, um, Take a look, take a close look at those comments, uh, those, those statements on websites um, or on LinkedIn or wherever. See how many of them don't mention the word Russia. Yeah. And, the, and the, the, there's some obvious thinking behind that. But I have to say that we are also perhaps surprised also by the position taken by some. Uh, also international government uh, intergovernmental organization or inter um, international organizations which we would have expect would be kind of much more um, vocal but let's leave it to the side we want to focus on companies today um, let me just move to Ashley uh, Reynolds Ashley if you could introduce yourself um, as many of us know you from from your previous role I think it's important to mention what you are doing now and also share your views on the situation and what can be contributed from the ITRC side. Hi everyone yes I need to explain as some of you know I was working with the Business and Human Rights Resource Center on their work in Eastern Europe until just a couple of weeks ago uh, I've switched over to the International Committee of the Red Cross working on their business and human rights programming in light of this because of the um, humanitarian mission of the Red Cross and to advance that I'm not allowed to state any position on the conflict itself but what I can offer and quickly provide are resources uh, very concrete resources for businesses that find themselves operating in conflict affected contexts, not just, uh, you know, the conflicts in Eastern Europe, but worldwide. So one of the main things that I really, really need to emphasize and has been already expressed by some of the other speakers is that international humanitarian law applies to all conflict affected contexts and applies to all actors, including businesses and including their staff. Businesses may be subject to liability for violations of international humanitarian law. So it needs to be extremely central to them that they identify what are their gaps in capacity, identify what their responsibilities are. And I can provide some resources in the chat explaining IHL in very clear terms to companies so that they can know what this means. It's also very, very important to have do no harm as a priority. It's wonderful to provide humanitarian aid to those who need help, but it's also very important to systematically consider the impacts of business decisions, not just on the company itself, but on affected populations and all other kinds of stakeholders. In doing so, it is very, very critical to have a conflict sensitive approach. A conflict sensitive approach has been explained, um, for example, by this Business and Human Rights Resource Center recently uh, in the publication that Ella has dropped in the chat. Um, but essentially this means that business needs to be aware of what the conflict dynamics are to understand their role within those dynamics. Um, and that's very, very, very critical at this moment. 
as I mentioned, there are some tools and guidance available to assist in this, to help companies understand what their responsibilities and roles are. Um, I want to mention just a few of these. The Australian Red Cross has a portal on international humanitarian law for business, including a guide on doing responsible business in armed conflict. I will provide this resource. Another important resource hub that I want to mention is that um, that has been created by the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance and the International Committee of the Red Cross relating to security. A few of the speakers have already mentioned security being an issue, have mentioned PMSCs and contractors and all of these sorts of very difficult security decisions of how do we provide it, who do we hire. So there is a toolkit available on having responsible human rights compliant uh, provision of security and working with both public and private security. There's a new version of that toolkit being released also with support of the Geneva Center um, on Business and Human Rights this upcoming summer, but you can find uh, older versions of the toolkit online. And again, I'll provide that. There's also an e-learning on international humanitarian law and a conflict prevention tool. Again, not all of this is going to be relevant in the Ukrainian context, but we do want everyone to know that there are resources out there to help companies understand what this is, because we understand this isn't always a normal operating environment um, for them. So yes, please, the International Committee of the Red Cross has um, resources. We know who's plugged in um, to these discussions on responsible business conduct. So thank you all for contributing to the discussion today. Thank you very much, Ashley, and many thanks for pointing us to some of the resources that are actually uh, designed for, let's say, non-academic audience. I think what, uh, what we are seeing actually in practice right now is that um, we were focusing a lot. A lot has been done, obviously, on some practical tools for business and advising how they should be implementing human rights due diligence. But I have impressions that we still have much more purely um, academic and um, international kind of, let's say, um, internationally languaged um, documents and very practical tools helping to kind of make, make a difference step-by-step step or implement some processes step-by-step, step. but it might be a bit biased. Um, I would like to ask for the comment Ala Timofieva uh, from Human Rights Research Center of Faculty of Law from the Charles University. Um, who also um, would be uh, sharing with us a little bit about the actions of the Czech companies. Um, sorry, we kind of had to change the agenda a little bit. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you very much, Beata, for the floor. And Elena, thank you for uh, your courage and for this conference and for the possibility to organize it in such a short time and uh, involve so many people in this event. It's really surprising, amazing, and I hope that uh, we can arrange uh, by our efforts something at least which could be of assistance to Ukraine and to the world's peace and security in general, because I have heard the news about the China and North Korea and so on. So I'm afraid that it will not be only the conflict of Ukraine, but it could be a worldwide problem of peace and security at all. So uh, uh, I have prepared the short pre uh, presentation. If you don't mind, I would like to share it. I just um, try to, yeah. So very, uh, very, uh, can you, can you uh, see it or, or not? Uh, yes, we can see it, but uh, just to remind of the shortness of the times that we have for this yeah, intervention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. I will just uh, um, uh, we'll just uh, go directly to introduction and say uh, that uh, uh, we all know about the second pillar of UNGP, and just I wanted to uh, mention that the Czech National Action Plan uh, just have no special any provisions concerning the business conduct in times of war. And uh, regarding uh, the good practices uh, which are taken by uh, the Czech companies, uh, I have uh, divided them into three uh parts uh, the financial support material support and other actions and uh, 
it's a question about whether all of them are uh, in line with business and human rights conduct or something goes beyond. So I consider, for example, that business and financial support, it's which something which goes uh, beyond it and uh, uh, check uh, support, financial support. These are just some examples uh, of uh, companies uh, who, uh, uh, again, as uh, the uh, a colleague said, that uh, maybe uh, they try uh, to do uh, their best, but maybe not all the companies provide uh, as much uh, sources as they could uh, provide. Regarding uh, the material support, uh, for example, uh, Benta hospitals, uh, they provide in all their hospitals medical support for free for Ukrainians. And uh, uh, Czech Bar Association, uh, they made a list, it's available here. I don't know if it will be seen from the presentation, but they have, uh, um, I don't know, new share, maybe you can see it this way. Can you, can you see it uh, this way? I'm afraid we can see still only, oh yes, now we, yes. okay. So now there is actually the list of uh, legal services uh, of attorneys at law who provide for free legal support for Ukrainians who came to the Czech Republic. In comparison to the situation in Slovakia, which was uh, mentioned here in the Czech Republic, uh, the Czech Republic provides the Ukrainians with special visas for the moment, but this visa uh, only allow a longer stay for one year period of time, but it does not uh, provide the permission to work. Uh, there are projects that for the future, it will be probably open to Ukrainians, but currently uh, they have only this, uh, only, uh, this provision. And uh, I will go quickly to the practices uh, concerning uh, other practices. This is activities about which uh, uh, Professor Chernich uh, uh, said uh, about uh, the uh, decision of Czech companies to stop, suspend, or reduce their activities. So, uh, for example, uh, famous companies, uh, uh, Pilsen, Urquil, and Škoda, uh, they, uh, in the press releases in media, there is information on the, on the fact that they are going to leave Russian market. But uh, when I check their web pages, uh, there is no any uh, statement made by them on their own web pages. So I don't know whether this is official information or just, just this uh, media news. So what I wanted uh, to say is that uh, Czech uh, business takes a lot of effort to, to respect human rights, but still I believe that the situation is not so clear how to help, what to do. And I believe that what is necessary is that for the future uh, Czech National Action Plan for Business and Human Rights for the next period of 2023-2028, maybe to provide more specified information on the subject matter. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Ala, for sharing this and also showing how, um, how the situation looks from um, Czech Republic and what actions are taking there. And um, I wanted to close the commentators section with um, contribution was a statement from uh, Ms. Anastasia Tokunova uh, from the Institute of Economic and Legal Research of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, who is also a business and human rights uh, expert, and she was evacuated from Krematorsk, Donetsk, uh, from Donetsk region. Um, and I think it's kind of best if we hear kind of the final commentator's words from, from you. Uh, thank you for the possibility to speak today. Uh, I've got only two not uh, too large comments. Uh, the first one is uh, concerning providing state guidelines to business on how to respect human rights. Um, yesterday, there was a meeting between the authorities of the Transcarpathian region. It's the region of Ukraine, which uh, now uh, meets, uh, which is located near the border. And uh, now it, uh, it meets a lot of uh, IDPs and local businesses. Uh, and uh, representative, representatives of the authorities told what is needed and uh, businesses suggested how they can um, 
can realize uh, these requests. And as far as I know, there were uh, a number of agreements uh, reached. And uh, it seems to me that it's a very good uh, example of not only interaction, but also providing business with guidelines from the authorities, from the side of the state, of uh, how to uh, ensure human rights in the region as much as it's possible in the current conditions. Uh, so maybe it's not at the central level, but at the local one, but it, uh, it can work as a solution now. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, this is a very good, um, um, it, it, um, it could be useful uh, uh, to be extended to other regions. Also, uh, perhaps from the side of the think tanks and practitioners, uh, included those uh, who are present presented uh, on on the today's meeting. Uh, it's possible to formulate uh, some uh, very short and very clear recommendations on what businesses need to do, what what exactly uh, authorities should uh, direct them about. Uh, for example, those proposals which um, Ganna Christova told or Ellis Kebenka concerning the guidance or uh, Ms. Uh, Ashley uh, Reynolds and other that uh, were discussed today. And uh, secondly, it's um, uh, the second point, point is about it was shown that uh, many businesses now are supported uh, the position of Ukraine during the war. Uh, uh, it, uh, it applies uh, both for Ukrainian uh, entrepreneurs who gives their buildings, their vehicles, their resources, often for free. And uh, foreign businesses uh, that uh, both send uh, direct assistance to Ukraine and try to influence Russia by refusing to work with it. Uh, for, uh, for example, this initiative, uh, Stand, Stand with Ukraine, uh, brought together many global companies from, uh, from Visa to IKEA, and uh, which are following the idea of breaking off business relationships uh, with the Russian Federation as a response to its massive human rights violations. And uh, despite the fact that uh, even already uh, the, support, uh, the support is active and massive, in my opinion, we have to expand it even more. In any case, we have no, ch no choice. The offensive continues. Con con continues. Uh, one of the options then can motivate more businesses to be involved in this work, both foreign and national ones. Uh, can be a resource where cases of responsible business behavior are, uh, are collected and shown. Uh, this resource could be fulfilled uh, from, for example, uh, Marina Saprikina's uh, um, investigation, which uh, she wrote about uh, in the chat, uh, or, uh, for example, site prehistoric, or um, uh, maybe there, uh, and also there uh, this information is also collected, but uh, usually it's distributed in a very, very long Google Docs. I can share one as an example later. Uh, so, and uh, also, uh, I guess that the kind of holder should keep this register, maybe government agency, maybe uh, NGO uh, authorized by government, but is for me, uh, it should be like a kind of official thank you from the country uh, to, to let businesses uh, know that Ukraine sees their contribution and appreciates it uh, to, again, to rise in the motivation to do it again and again. Um, and uh, the same resource can be used not only for, only for naming, but also for shaming, because, uh, you know, some businesses, as Olena told at the very beginning, uh, use the situation to maximize profit uh, without regards to the interests of the people. So thanks a lot for the possibility. Thank you very much, Anastasia. And um, I just would like to open the floor if there is anybody who would like to contribute or um, at your perspective or ask a question. I know that some questions were already, that were ask, asked in the chat are already answered, so I won't be coming back to them, but if there is anybody who don't, would like to take the floor, uh, this is the moment. 
And in between, I'll just say that what sounded very strongly for me is that, yes, we've got this very strong movement among the companies when it comes to support internally in Ukraine and outside in various ways, um, not only from the side of um, companies, but also NGOs, that there is a huge need for proper coordination of those efforts in a way that is safe. And I think this, from my perspective, I think this is one of those areas where uh, due, diligence, due diligence can really come in, because even with regards to humanitarian aid, we've heard that there are some very concrete people that can be contacted. Um, so it's important that companies just don't send uh, humanitarian aid, um, even if it's possible, because we understand that in some countries that's coordinated by state, but there where it's uh, more open, it's also important to make sure that you know, as a company, where you're actually sending it, that it's not just being collected and then out of a sudden um, it's just being sold somewhere on the streets when it should be delivered for free. So I think it's also those, um, I would say, maybe not minor, but kind of less impactful or um, less visible aspects that uh, should be taken care of. Um, I think there is a so huge, and we've heard it, that this role of state should be much stronger, um, that state should be much more active in setting the frameworks in, within which um, companies would operate. And that there is this huge need for gathering all the uh, guidance, recommendations, probably in one place, sharing it, making it available. Uh, because at the moment, indeed, there are plenty of places where you can find, there are plenty of organizations that are placing them on what they have developed on their websites, but it's very difficult to just kind of go to one place and just have a full picture. And, um, and this is extremely important to have one verified place from which to source information. Um, be it for business um, who stays within, the, uh, within Ukraine or for business that kind of moves to other countries so that they know how to operate, to know what rights they have, what are the legal regulations that are applying to them, particularly at the time when um, those rules are being kind of changed uh, on everyday basis. Um, I think it's really strong, uh, a really big importance for the state to Communicate it very clearly. Um, Elena, I, um, if you would like to take over. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Rata. I would like to give the floor to Marina Saplikina because uh, she is with us and I think that uh, she has what to say. Yeah. Uh, uh, hello, Elena. Can I speak Ukrainian? Um, добре, тому що я не, підготував, не готувалася англійською, але тим не менше я хочу сказати, що дійсно ми проаналізували 195 компаній, як вони допомагають Україні, це компанії, які працюють в Україні, я хочу виділити деякі... О, ви мене не чуєте? А тепер не чуєте? Це було some issue with uh, translation, because it was over. Ah, so, so I should speak uh, English, right? I think it shouldn't matter, but indeed for a moment, at least mm -hmm. um, people who are listening to the English okay. translation couldn't hear, uh, couldn't hear it much. But uh, Michal, can you advise, please? Uh, sorry, but I heard the, the translation, English translation, and it was okay. Maybe. Uh... Okay. Um, uh, отже, деякі напрями. Перше, це, звичайно, наші компанії – це гроші. Вони дають гроші, um, гроші… Uh... I think both Ukrainian and English are being spoken at the same time, so it becomes hard to follow. So... Um, okay, so let me… Let's try let again. I, I, I will try to, uh, to mute the original language, okay? Please try again. Давайте ще раз. Гроші. А все нормально зараз? Окей, а, гроші це нашим, нашим збройним, а, а, збройним силам України та відповідним фондам. І вам вже говорили, скільки... Sorry, the same, same problem. Um, um, okay, is... okay, no the problem. The problem is the same thing. Apologies, yeah. English. So, um, uh, we analyzed 195 companies in Ukraine, and uh, I would like just to mention uh, several uh, priority areas for companies, what they have, have, have been doing. So, first, 
first, it's uh, providing money. And for example, Nova Poshta, it's a very big logistic company in Ukraine. And I know that Elena tried to invite them for this meeting. They provided 25 million uh, grivnias for, uh, for help, help in Ukraine. Uh, the second, it's humanitarian aid, and uh, especially with logistics, with products, etc. First, a third is um, uh, media support, media support, and inf and tech support, uh, I mean telecom support, because for example now, uh, perhaps you know that three Ukrainian companies, they created national roaming, so if for example I do not have, um, do not have um, connection on my uh, mobile operator, I could switch to another one. It's national roaming which now uh, uh, exists in Ukraine. Um, and also what is very interesting is boycott of Russian, Russian goods. And uh, there are several supermarkets in Ukraine which stopped um, working with uh, companies who um, have some uh, connections with Russia. For example, um, it, it had some relations with Coca-Cola when they continue um, working in Russia, etc. Um, and also regarding employees, because Elena, when you um, present it, uh, presented uh, what company can do as an employer, we found that mostly IT company, they are very um, concerned with relocation, with financial and humanitarian support, and also agricultural company, which also uh, increased uh, money increased salary for their employees, uh, which is uh, nice. And also some national companies, state-owned companies, they are uh, paid to their employees for two months ahead. Uh, that's uh, what we have noticed, but also what we can do. And I think it's very important because we also discussed with CSI associations. And now I can tell you about my disappointment because many companies which, which continue their um, activities in Russia, they are members of CSI associations in all across Europe. And I think that it's very important to talk uh, to them and said that um, it's, um, it's extremely important to stop business as usual um, because we should uh, think about human rights, about democratic values uh, for which Ukraine is striving now and fighting now. Um, so what we can do? I think it's very important also to write to your companies who continue uh, working in Russia and uh, ask them to uh, consider the opportunity to stop this because now it's uh, unfortunately it's bloody business and um, their taxes uh, um, help uh, to uh, to continue this war against Ukrainian uh, people. Uh, the second, uh, I think, it's very important to boycott uh, Russian Russian um, uh, products, but also I think it's very important. Uh, it's, it's extremely important to raise new discussion about business role in SDG 16. Uh, what does it mean? What business should do, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I think that um, we and Olena and Beata, I think, uh, and, and many, many other associations should uh, uh, work in this direction because um, it's, uh, for example, a global compact, they provided some guidance. It's, it's very short guidance, what uh, companies can do uh, regarding this war uh, of Russia against Ukraine. But it's very short because yes, so we, um, I mean, as CSR consultants, we aren't prepared for, the, for such kind of things. And we should uh, continue working on this and provide more recommendations, more uh, practical guidance to companies. And also what we, uh, what we noticed about ESG, Beata, you mentioned about ESG. Uh, again, what we noticed that banks uh, continue invest investing now in Russian uh, companies. And I think, um, and there is also some task force in Ukraine, uh, we try to write to ESG funds and to um, ESG consultants and ESG ranking agencies to stop working with Russia, Russian companies because it's uh, uh, extremely, um, strange to to talk about ESG and uh, sustainability in Russian companies if they still work in um, 
in Ukraine. So there are a lot of uh, questions, a lot of issues, but I think we can do a lot and uh, um, public um, demand um, means a lot. And it's just one example. Uh, there is, was one uh, Japanese company in, Ukraine, in Russia, which said several days ago that they continue working in Ukraine because clothes is number one um, necessity of, uh, for people. But after public pressure, several days later, they said that they stopped their, uh, uh, their operation there. So public, public demand uh, is, is very important and we can do a lot of things. <laughs> I think we had the same reaction, Ms. Elena. Thank you very much, Marina, for this contribution. And I think it's you, Elena, who should take the, you know, that should be now in, in control of the mic. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all of you who join us uh, today and uh, thank you for all contributions today. And uh, we are going to prepare the brief overview of all ideas, all thoughts uh, that uh, were shared today. Yeah? And uh, we will share with all participants this overview and uh, more widely. So th thank you very much. And uh, I totally agree with Marina. We have a lot of what we should do. So yeah, thank you. And thank you very much for staying with us longer. Um, at first, we thought that it will be too long, <laughs> and later on, it turned out that indeed it's not enough. Um, but as you've seen, it was more of a trying to catch the moment, trying to understand what is on ongoing on the ground, what sort of challenges are being faced by companies and geos. Uh, we will most likely follow with another event, which perhaps will be a little bit more um, kind of focused on the academics, on the standards. But at the moment, we thought it's important to understand really what's happening on the ground. It's easy to talk at the level of standards and how important it is to implement due diligence, but without knowing what is actually happening and how difficult it is to implement even the basic steps, I think we want to be able to provide some really meaningful guidance. So therefore, we thought that this format will be um, best uh, for now. So thank you very much for joining us today. And as Elena said, um, will be making overview and sharing it with, with everybody. Um, if you would have any uh, additional links or materials that you would like to include, I mean, for sure, we won't be sending it over before the weekend. So if you would send us any additional links or comments, we can include it still um, in the final material. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining. Alana, thank you very much for being able to run this and take the leadership in organizing this uh, event, um, despite being still in Ukraine. So huge, huge thanks to you and words of admiration. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you.